afternoon, my name is Raul Flores. I am the Public Program and Development Officer at DORIS. Um, the New York, the Department of Records and Information Services, also known as DORIS, preserves and provides public access to historical and contemporary records and information about New York City government. We operate the Municipal Archive, the Municipal Library, and the Records Center. Welcome to our Launch and Learn series. Today we have two wonderful friends and two wonderful co-workers. Um, we have Alexandra Hilton, she's the head of collections management at the Municipal Archive. And we also have Amy, Amy Stetcher, has been the project archivist for the Manhattan Building Plans Project since, no, since the summer of 2018. Today, we have inside the Department of Buildings, Architectural Plans and Drawings. Now I'm gonna pass the torch to Amy and Alexander. Hi, uh, I'm Amy Stecker. As Raul said, I'm the project archivist for the Manhattan Buildings Plans Collection here at the Archives. Um, I began working on this project in July of 2018. So it's been a few years now and we are determinately plugging our way through tens of thousands of building plans. Uh, we have processed close to 30,000 plans at this point. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, we'd like to give you some background about the collection and how we acquired it and tell, tell you a little about the processing and conservation activities we're engaged in. And then we will move on to some highlights of the collection. So the collection we're discussing today is the Department of Buildings Architectural Plans and Drawings for Lower Manhattan, circa 1866 to 1978, which consists of the plans for buildings on the 958 blocks of Manhattan below 34th Street. These plans were required to be filed by builders, architects, plumbers, electricians, and others whenever they built a new building or altered an existing building in New York City. The need to submit plans for review to the DOB has been required since the late 1860s when the Department of Buildings was officially established. Prior to the existence of the DOB, the Department of Buildings, <laughs> there was some building regulation, but it was not always well enforced or consistent. As far back as 1625, the Dutch West India Company imposed rules for the locations and types of homes that could be built in the colony. This image here shows ordinances from the early records of New Amsterdam, um, this is part of the collection here at the archives. And the bottom right section is an ordinance condemning roofs made of reeds and wooden and plaster chimneys. Throughout the next 200 years, the various entities in charge of the city issued many regulations about building, mostly related to sanitation and public safety, particularly from the hazard of fire. There is a very good reason for this. There were devastating fires in the city in 1776, 1835, and 1845. On the left here is a depiction of the 1776 fire, and on the right, the 1845 fire. That fire destroyed 345 buildings in the financial district and killed 40 people. So fire was a huge concern. A ban on erecting new wood frame buildings below Canal Street was enacted in 1816. By 1849, that ban had been extended to 32nd Street. And by 1882, no wood frame homes were allowed to be built below 155th Street. In addition to fire, the other major contributing factor for building regulation was the exponential growth of the city. In the first half of the 19th century, overcrowding became a significant issue. The city's population increased from a little over 60,000 people in 1800 to over 800,000 people by 1860. By 1865, over 15,000 tenements had already been established. As you can see from this illustration, single family buildings were adapted to fit as many people as possible, and existing structures added more floors or back built into their already small yards, leaving practically no open space between building lots for light or ventilation. The city had experienced epidemics of cholera, yellow fever, typhoid, and overcrowding in close quarters with little ventilation and unsanitary conditions contributed to the spread. These are some tenement plans from our buildings collection. The 1892 drawing on the left is a particularly good example of what's known as an old law or dumbbell tenement. In 1860, the New York State Legislature passed an act to provide against unsafe buildings in the city of New York, calling for the appointment of a superintendent of buildings and a staff of inspectors. 
Over the next 40 years, the city and state enacted many changes to try to address the major problems the city faced, including the establishment of a Bureau of Fire Escapes and Iron Work in 1874, and the, Bureau, uh, and the Bureaus of Plumbing, Light, and Heat in 1892. Tenement Acts passed in 1867 and 1879 mandated fire escapes, but failed to adequately address issues of light and ventilation, leading to the Tenement Act of 1901, which imposed many more regulations, such as requiring new buildings to have outward facing windows, indoor bathrooms, proper ventilation, and increased fire safeguards. Population growth also meant the city's economy grew and became more complex, creating the need for larger and more versatile spaces. The introduction of new technologies such as the elevator and steel frame construction allowed ever larger and taller buildings to rise in lower Manhattan. On the left here is an example of an elaborate fire escape for building on Washington Place. It's actually the building where the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire occurred. On the right is a lovely detailed drawing of an early wooden elevator shaft from 1896 for a building on Mercer Street. And these are all images, all these images are plans that we have in our collection. Um, advances in the water supply system, sanitary engineering, access to gas and electricity for illumination and cooking, and central heating systems added to the complexity of building construction and to the variety of types of plans that needed to be filed with the DOB. Here are some plans from the collection showing these sorts of details. On the left are new lighting fixtures in the DA's office on Center Street. And on the right are some precise column details for an 18th century, I'm sorry, 18 story loft building on West 34th Street. That's from 1927. And then there's so much plumbing. We have so many plumbing drawings. Um, we have seen thousands of plumbing drawings and these are actually two of my favorites. Uh, the very artistic sink and toilets on the left is from the Manhattan House of Detention. And on the right is an extremely detailed drawing uh, that in even includes in the center a riser for liquid soap that was distributed throughout the whole building. The sort of cluster of things on the right side, those are all um, sinks and toilets. It's a very elaborate drawing. So all this growth and innovation required control and bureaucracy, and that means paperwork. Paperwork in the form of applications and permits and plans and drawings. Increasingly trained architects and engineers, rather than tradespeople and builders, were needed to navigate the complexities of the system and to draw up proper plans. This is an example of a block and lot folder containing permit applications, building forms, and associated correspondence. These papers now make up the, the Manhattan block and lot records, which is a, a separate collection available to the public here at the archives. So this paperwork and all the corresponding plans are filed according to something called the block and lot system. Uh, it provides every city parcel of land with a unique identifying number. This is an 1897 Bromley insurance map showing that the block and lot system that we still use today has already been established by 1897. These insurance maps were updated over time and they're a very helpful tool for us in identifying historical block and lot numbers. So the DOB retained the bulk of these materials until the early 1970s when it initiated a pilot project to save space by microfilming the building plans that accumulated over the previous century. They employed an outside vendor for the microfilming, intending to dispose of the original materials after filming. The idea of disposing of the original materials raised alarms, rightly so, uh, among the city's community of historians, architects, and preservationists, including the Landmarks Preservation Commission. So they monitored the quality of the microfilm and it was determined that the film did not meet accepted standards. The project was discontinued after filming the surviving plans for all buildings on the 958 blocks of Lower Manhattan, uh, the blocks below 34th Street. So that it's at that point that they decided to transfer the plans to us here at the archives. So, in 1979, an initial group of 1,000 rolls of blueprints and plans were acquired by the archives and more kept coming. By 1984, the archives conducted an inventory of the accumulated rolled plans and concluded that they had acquired a total of 5,738 rolls of plans. 
Until 2018, these plans were in storage in the same state that they had arrived in, occasionally being pulled by archive staff for use by researchers if the researchers knew they existed. So in 2018, the archives received a grant from the New York State Library Conservation Preservation Discretionary Grant Program to process and rehouse a subset of the Manhattan building plans that pertain, that pertain to the neighborhoods of Tribeca and Soho. This allowed staff to be hired to begin tackling the plans. That's me um, and others. Uh, once the approximately 140 blocks encompassing those two neighborhoods were completed in the fall of 2019, we started working on the lowest blocks in Manhattan. So all this material has been in storage uh, in the archives since the 1970s. And we have faced some daunting issues in our processing, as you can see here. Uh, first, the state of the material and the storage conditions have been pretty bad. Uh, the vendor hired to do the microfilming when finished with their part of the task and believing that the original material was going to be disposed of, uh, haphazardly and messily rewrapped the plans in acidic wrapping paper, tightly tied it with damaging twine, and labeled each bundle with minimal and often insufficient information. The second main problem we have is inaccurate and insufficient labeling. A block can contain up to 70 or 80 lots, sometimes all rolled together. Over time, when buildings are expanded or torn down and new or larger buildings are built or buildings are combined, the lot number can change. So the lot numbers written on these plans, often written in very, very boldly and horrifying black magic marker, um, are essentially only completely accurate to what the lot was in the 1970s when the microfilming was taking place. The outside of the rolls often lists only the block number, and the lot numbers are sometimes only identified inside the roll on loose slips of paper or not at all. So you can't really know what's in the roll until you look, and often we find a lot of surprises. For example, all these different block and lot labels were together inside one roll with their plans, and the roll was identified on the outside with only one of these block numbers. So it's really not helpful when you're trying to find specific lots for a researcher. When we identify the plans, we record the block and lot number uh, that existed when the plan was made. And we also note that the DOB online building information system, uh, what it's calling that lot now. Uh, our concern is that some researchers are asking for material based on numbers from the current DOB website, some from old insurance and old block and lot maps, and some from old paperwork. So the numbers that people use are not always going to match up with what the plan was in 1970, so what that indicates. So we're trying to provide multiple entry points for researchers. We also record the address on the plan, although there isn't always an address to be found, as well as the range of addresses now used by the DOB if those are different. Plans with no address or block or lot designation, and there are more of those than you would think, um, will almost always be stamped with a DOB plan number, and these numbers help us figure out what the address of the building is, and then we can determine the block and lot. So you can see from the images so far that in order to find unprocessed plans for a researcher, we have to dig out the correct rolls from an overstuffed, dusty shelf and determine accuracy. So it has been an arduous process, and the condition the material was stored in, dust-covered acidic brown wrapping paper with edges, sticking out of the ends has caused a lot of damage. Um, plans have been rolled, so you can see here, <laughs> not very good. Um, plans have been rolled carelessly together with all manner of items. We have found inside the rolls scissors, tea bags, cigarette butts, and pencils. Uh, some older plans were stored rolled on wooden sticks and attached with brass fasteners, or often the microfilming crew stapled blank pieces of paper to the plans to separate them, and that caused the need for us uh, to remove hundreds and hundreds of staples. So it's a big task for our rolled plans processing team to process and rehouse these plans, to reestablish intellectual control over the material, and to create more optimal retrieval and storage conditions. So here is a condensed list on the left of the tasks that we perform on each roll, and on the right is a roll. Um, in short, the dusty bundles are unrolled and the plans are identified, sorted, flattened, repaired if damaged, counted and cataloged, and carefully and neatly re-rolled onto acid-free tubes, 
wrapped with protected mylar and stored in acid-free boxes. The method for organizing the plans is still block and lot number. So all the plans for all the buildings or structures built on a particular city lot and all the changes and alterations made to an already existing building on that lot are stored together. When sorting the plans, we verify the block and lot information and record it, as well as recording addresses, the quantity of plans, dates, and notes on architects, important features, and major condition concerns that are passed on, that then we pass that on to our conservation department. So on the right here is a rolled bundle. Um, and then on the, here we have a bundle that after it is unrolled on the left. And on the right here, the plans are being flattened by being placed under boards and light weights. And then this is an example of a repair. Uh, we remove old tape repairs when possible and do repairs with heat set tissue and attacking iron. Uh, because these drawings span more than 100 years and consist of many different print types created by many different processes, uh, some, which, some of which can cause degradation over time. Um, here are some examples of the different kinds of print types found within a roll. Uh, we have a blueprint, a drawing on drafting linen, and what looks like an aniline print, which those aniline prints, the bottom left, can become very brittle. Uh, within each lot group, these drawings are separated according to print type, and these types are separated by sheets of mylar to avoid chemical migration between these different types of plans. So then the plans are rolled, and you can see the mylar, and then tied with tool tape and boxed in acid-free boxes. And those tubes are also acid-free tubes. So all the important information for each block and lot group is recorded in a spreadsheet, which allows us to see which buildings we have material for and exactly where it is now located. And then here is the newly rehoused material back on the shelf. Hooray. <laughs> so clearly it's a really big multi-year project, but it really is very worth it. Now when we receive inquiries about plans from researchers, we can tell immediately whether we do or do not hold plans for a particular address or block and lot number and can offer amounts of plans and date ranges simply by checking the spreadsheet. Retrieval of the actual plans once they're processed takes minutes instead of hours, and almost everything that has been processed is in a state that is now ready for scanning because the flattening and repair has already been performed. As of now, we are scanning on demand for researchers and also scanning particularly interesting or beautiful plans so that they can be part of our online gallery. It's also a project worth doing because the collection has so much to offer that it's now becoming more accessible to the public. The collection comprises multiple forms of graphic representation of buildings, from pencil sketches by carpenters to carefully measured sections and plans by drafters, intricate elevations by trained architects. There are examples of all types of uses, industrial, manufacturing, retail, residential, and every type of building in the city. Office buildings, stores, factories, warehouses, hotels, theaters, churches, schools, stables, garages, and more. Here are a few examples so you can see the variety of material in the collection. Um, elevation drawings, floor plans, details of homes and businesses, structures large and small. In the slide on the left, we have a nice longitudinal elevation drawing. And on the right side, you have a left, front, and longitudinal and side elevations. Um, here on the left is a typical floor plan. These are blueprints. A typical floor plan from a townhouse on West 10th Street, uh, designed by Ernest Flagg. And it's very nice. Um, you can see the library. Um, and on the right is some elaborate, is a elevation, a front elevation showing elaborate signage for the Orbax department store, which used to be near Union Square. That drawing's from 1941. Um, there are also some wonderful detailed drawings. Uh, and with unexpected details. Um, uh, on the left is a baker's oven from 1901 from a bakery at 26 Prince Street. In the center is a spiral staircase from 1950, 1915 uh, in the terminal warehouse on the west side. 
And on the right side is something called a mahogany annunciator. I just like that one. It's a small detail on a larger plan, um, sort of a lighted call panel where you would call a servant or maybe a dumb waiter elevator. So of course, many well-known architects work can be found in this collection. The material process to date includes plans submitted by Emery Roth, John B. Snook, H.J. Hardenberg, Francis Kimball, and many others. This drawing here is from 1906. It's one of my favorites. It's the New York Life Insurance Building uh, at 346 Broadway, also known as the Clock Tower Building. It was designed by McKim, Mead, and White. But for me, the real importance in the collection is the inclusive nature. All plans filed by all persons engaged in new construction or alteration, which means that the work of lesser known architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople of all kind are represented as well. The mandatory nature of the compilation of the collection by the DOB allows uncurated access to both high end and utilitarian design information. The plans of a luxury apartment building and a tenement, skyscraper and gas station, plumbing riser schematics for 27 stories or the installation of a single sink or toilet. As a whole, it becomes a unique and essential source of documentation of the physical growth of New York City over time. And it's an amazing source for researchers of all kinds. So, so far we've processed about 30,000 drawings. The original estimate was that there were 100,000, but I think that was a very a low estimate. I think there are more. In 2019, additional rolled plans totaling approximately 243 cubic feet were located at our records management warehouse in Queens. Um, an initial survey of that material indicates that it contains blocks both below 34th Street and above, including the area around Central Park. So there's some really nice um, apartment buildings drawings in those. And then during the pandemic, additional rolls were found in the Queens warehouse that I haven't had a chance to see yet. So clearly there's a lot more work to be done. So I'm just finishing my part here with this gratuitous shot of uh, before and after screen because it makes me feel good. And I'm gonna turn it over to Alex now to, dis to discuss some of the plans that have already been discovered and talk a bit about the history of those plans, uh, the buildings that those plans were created for. So yeah, as Amy said, I'm just gonna go through some of the buildings that have been found over the past few years and have really neat histories. Um, it's kind of hard to choose just a few and there's so many more to be discovered. So I'm really excited to see what comes next with this project. Um, so the first one is, is the Little Singer building. So the 12 story Little Singer building was designed by Ernest Flagg for the Singer Sewing Machine Company in 1903. It's located in Soho at 561, 563 Broadway between Spring and Prince Streets. The intricate iron trace tracery on the exterior makes this one very distinctive and you'd be hard pressed to miss it if you walked by. It's a style unique to the time period. So here you can see where it's located. Um, it has like this really fun L shape um, and like nestles around the buildings here. And the left in this slide is one of our tax photos from another collection that's all online in our online gallery. So I definitely go and check that out if you're interested in buildings. So Ernest Flagg, he was known for his Beaux-Arts style, built the iron structure to be fireproof with brick and terracotta a relatively new innovation at the time with a rusty red and green colored scheme. Any potential for heaviness was alleviated by the large amount of recessed glass on the front of the building, along with the delicate wrought iron tracery. There are bolted iron plates that make vertical pilasters to mark the end bays and spondrels between each story. Five central, central bays join vertically with curled iron tracery at the top of the 11th story where the cornice is also supported by raw iron brackets. A top story, simple in comparison, is set above it. More of the same look could be seen around the bottom two stories. Tracery continues around the window bases and a lacy strip balconies across each story. It's all very ornamental. As it's an L-shaped building, there's also a side-facing 
Prince Street, whose facade is essentially a narrower version of the Broadway side with the addition of a sign that reads the Singer Manufacturing Company. A few years after completing this building in 1904, Flag was retained to build a larger structure for the Singer Company, which is when this one became known as Little, and the second Singer building was finished in 1908. It was briefly the tallest building in the world and demolished in 1968. In 1979, this guy, the Little Singer Building, was converted to a co-op with offices and joint living and work quarters. In 2008, it received a much needed facelift, which included a, a recreation of the original glass and ironwork sidewalk canopy on the Broadway side. Next building is the Rivington Street Bathhouse, which is really cool. Another tax photo is on the left hand side here. Um, here you can see its location. Uh, the Rivington Street Bathhouse at 326 Rivington Street, later renamed the Baruch Bathhouse, was the first in the city to be built with public funds. Ground on the bathhouse was broken in in December of 1897, and it opened on March 23rd, 1901. Katie, Berg, and C designed the large neoclassical building. They had become the go-to designers for municipal bathhouses after the success of the People's Bath, a public bath that had been privately fundraised for by the New York Association for Improving the Condition of the Poor, or the AICP. The bath opened in 1891 at Nine Center Marketplace off of Broom Street and on the block where the old police headquarters building still stands, and that's a pretty cool building too. Both the designers and Dr. Simon Baruch, who I'll talk more about in a minute, were keen on German design and their widespread use of showers, which at the time were referred to as rain baths or ring showers because of the circular shower head designed to keep hair dry, which I'm not sure how well that would have worked. <laughs> The Germans were using these for mass bathing situations, such as in military barracks. And they were a lot cheaper to build, easier to keep clean, they used less water, and they could get people in and out faster. So they became the staple of the bathhouse. Dr. Simon Baruch, who the Rivington Street Bathhouse was eventually named after, is regarded as the father of the public bath movement in the United States. He was a German immigrant to South Carolina when he was a teenager, where he studied medicine and joined the Civil War as a surgeon on the Confederate side, got captured at the Battle of Gettysburg, and subsequently a prisoner of war until it was all over. He made his way to New York City in 1881 and served as a physician on the Lower East Side, amongst a long list of other appointments and physicians in the New York City medical field. Baruch began advocating for public bathhouses in 1889 he was big on hydrotherapy at the time a new concept in the United States. Today, this would include stuff like hot tubs and jacuzzis, um, you know, just relaxing things. Uh, and this guided a lot of his endeavors. Municipal officials weren't as sold on the concept that poor sanitation would equal poor physical health for some reason, um, but he was tireless in promoting the utility of water and importance of a public bath system. For some reason, he was in the minority, even though in 1894, only 300, 306 out of 255,000 tenements in New York City had bathtubs. The people won't bathe, said then Mayor Hugh Grant, but by 1895, Baruch finally convinced the state legislature to pass a law mandating cities of over 50,000 people to establish and maintain free bath facilities. Logistics around the new bath law and facilitation of public bathhouses caused some lag. One of the hiccups concerned their location. Tompkins Square Park on the Lower East Side, then a predominantly German and Irish neighborhood, had been chosen as the location for the first bath. The residents couldn't have been less thrilled by this prospect, basically saying, hey, give it to those new Jewish and Italian immigrants instead. They were located further south. No one really wanted to be living in the community so poor that they needed a public bath there, which is understandable. And they didn't want a bathhouse messing with their already small park space. Their opposition was heard. Tompkins Square was no longer a contender. There was a question of whether public baths even had to be located in parks. The mayor and his committee on public baths thought it did. Baruch said no. 
Somehow they came over to his side and the spot on Rivington Street, already owned by the city, was chosen. The style of the Rivington Street bathhouse influenced the style of subsequently built baths in the city. William Paul Gerhard, who wrote a book titled Modern Baths and Bathhouses in 1908, said that the exterior of a people's bath or a public bath should be easily recognizable, so it would be easily found, but warned that it shouldn't be too lavish because nobody would want to go inside. Rivington Street wasn't exactly modest and it met criticism for its extravagance and costs, which ended up totaling over $95,000. Of course, its immediate success, the AICP recommended that another 16 bathhouses be built to the same specifications, saying it was actually more economical to build a cost less per shower compartment and to maintain it for the long haul. And they wanted like that ancient Roman public bath look with classical pilasters, columns, arches, and cornices, and built with hefty materials like brick, terracotta, stone, marble, and copper. They wanted them to last, and a lot of them did. And whatever its appearance, the bathing experience was pretty much the same. The three and a half foot building here was divided into two areas for a dedicated men's and women's area. The image on the left shows that. So um, the two rectangular areas at the top would be for men and then the far right was the women's area and right in front of those were the waiting rooms. So they were definitely separated. That was a really big deal. Um, and the men's had 45 rain baths and the women had 22. Then the bathtubs would be on the upper floors as you can see in the second drawing over here. Um, when a person entered the bathhouse, they were given a number and then they would wait for their number to be called for the next cubicle. They usually had 20 minutes to undress, bathe, and redress. They had the capacity to do 3,000 baths a day on this timetable. And attendants controlled the water temperature, which ranged from 73 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit, the duration of the shower, too. I'm sure it will come as no surprise to learn that the attendants soon began running a scheme where patrons could sneak them five cents for a limitless bath time, but eventually they got caught and were fired. Holes were later added to the complex in 1917. In 1939, Bernard Baruch, Dr. Baruch's more famous son, donated the land around the bathhouse to the city and jurisdiction of the building went to the Parks Department. They renovated the bathhouse to be a recreation center and added Baruch Playground. In the 1950s, New York City Housing Authority built Baruch Houses, Manhattan's largest public housing complex adjacent to the bathhouse. And by 1975, the city's fiscal crisis forced the facility to close. And it's pretty much sat unused ever since. So you can still walk by it. It looks a little sad though. Here's some more. Oh, the drawing on the right on this one shows the bathtubs a lot better on the upper floors. And on the left-hand side, you can see the transverse section showing one of, like Amy said, one of these fabulous plumbing plans uh, with all the different showers. Okay. The Margaret Louisa home was at 1416 East 16th Street. It's part of the Ladies Mile Historic District now and commissioned by the w a w c a benefactor, Margaret Louise Shepard, daughter of William H. Vanderbilt. It was built in connection with the YWCA with the intention of being a temporary home for Protestant women seeking employment. Robert Henderson Robertson designed the six-story home to accommodate 100 female residents. Construction was completed in 1891. It's a rock-faced brownstone with some interspersed brick in the Romanesque revival style. The letters YWCA are inscribed on the exterior at the top second floor, originally in this main level. The midsection is punctuated with these foliage designs, um, carved lion masks. Uh, there's the Romanesque columns running top to bottom. It's a pretty nice looking building. Um, inside there were 78 bedrooms, a parlor and reception room, private dining area, a public restroom and laundry. Bedrooms were furnished with a white painted iron bed, small oak table, a rocker and washstand with toilet set. At the rear of the lot, an annex was built, which is probably easier to see in this slide. Uh, you can see how they took over like two abutting blocks um, and the YMCA there on the left side was actually replaced later with the new building and became the YWCA along with the home on the right. 
Here's some plans for the annex and then one of the typical bedroom floors. So the annex here on the right was meant to be a studio or meeting room. Um, and the home was very, very successful. Boarders could stay for four weeks. And this was like an era where, you know, women weren't supposed to be self-sufficient. So it got like a little bit of flack for that, but they were just like churning them out. Churning them out. Um, the whole point of it was to help them find jobs. So a lot of women were teachers, milliners, dressmakers, stenographers, but there are also physicians, lecturers, actresses, nurses, photographers, all sorts of jobs were represented. Um, parallel to the home on this, the other law on 15th Street was that YWCA building. That's where women could take specialized courses. It was built before the home in 1887, also by Margaret Louisa and John Jacob Astor with other wealthy citizens. Robertson designed that building as well, also done in a Romanesque revival style with a mix of red brick and brown stone. An enclosed corridor and even intervening garden space connected the building to the home on 16th Street. Both buildings are still common today, used for different purposes now. The 16th Street YWCA was sold to the Society of the Commonwealth in 1917, where it became known as the People's House. Organizations such as the National Women's Suffrage Party, Margaret Sanger's Birth Control League of New York, and the Rand School, formed by members of the Socialist Party of America, took offices in that building. The Margaret Louisa home lasted longer and was operating until 1946. In 1951, it became the Sydney Hillman Health Center. The first floor was completely renovated and the facade was modernized at that time. Most recently, plans have been approved by the Landmarks Preservation Commission for turning this building into a hotel, which would include demolishing most of it but preserving the facade. As of 2020, developers plan to rebuild the first floor facade that was actually removed in the 50s. Um, you can see it in the drawings here. And also they want to recreate that gabled peak you can see in the top, top of the right. Um, that was actually never built and they want to include that with this new design. Hmm. Haven't seen any updates since September, but I'm guessing things are moving slow around in that department. Okay. This one's really cool. So I think I saw a question earlier asking if there were uh, drawings for demolished buildings and usually there aren't, um, but this one is. So there's possibilities, um, but this one's really cool. In 1891, the New Yorker fireboat became the first floating engine, as they called them, to have its own permanent shore station. No longer standing, it was located near Pier A in Castle Garden in Battery Park. So this one is actually like a before and then after they removed it. I was trying to figure out when they removed it. And I think it was around 1941, but by 1955, it was definitely not on a map anymore. The fire was until 1931, it was constructed by Julius Johnson Johnson and by Charles H. Haswell. Fire boats were part of Engine 57, the only one to be organized in 1959. The New Yorker was part of Engine 57. It was 125 feet long and around 350 tons and could pump 13,000 gallons of water a minute. It was the most powerful fireboat of its day. The building itself was built similarly to other engine houses and was intended to also be housing for the company. There was a bunk room upstairs. I thought I had a photo of that. Anyway, there was a bunk room upstairs and sliding poles to the ground floor and a complete set of telegraph instruments for informing the company of all alarms throughout the city. It also responded to fires that occurred on the water. Boat disasters weren't uncommon. The general Slocum steamboat tragedy occurred not long after the New Yorker went into service. And the New Yorker itself responded to many such tragedies. One well-known event is the 1900 Hoboken docks fire that happened in and around the Hoboken, New Jersey piers of a German shipping company. Cotton bales stored on the company's southernmost wharf caught fire and winds carried the fire to nearby barrels filled with turpentine and oil, causing them to explode, destroy the parts, um, destroy the piers all the way to the river line, as well as nearby warehouses, three transatlantic liners, and almost two dozen smaller boats. Everything in the river caught on fire and started drifting towards the New York City side, which is when several fireboats, including the New Yorker, were dispatched to make sure that the fire didn't effectively hop the river. Over 326 people lost their lives in the accident, mostly seamen and workers, but there's also a large group of women visiting one of the transatlantic ships that day, and they had a lot of casualties. 
Another incident that the New Yorker responded to was the Dreamland Park fire on Coney Island in 1911. The park was only open for seven years before it basically burned to the ground. On the night before opening day of the 1911 season, a water ride named Pelkey developed a leak. A contractor from a roofing company was repairing the ride using tar to plug up the leak. For reasons probably having to do with an electrical malfunction, the light bulbs illuminating the man's face as he worked just exploded, and in his surprise, he kicked over a bucket of hot tar he'd been working with. The ride immediately caught on fire. Most of the park was made out of frames of lath covered by a mixture of plaster and par of Paris and hemp fire, a wildly flammable combination. For some reason, Coney Island's amusement parks use this combo in construction often, so they had fires often, and because of this, a high pressure water pumping station had been installed a few years earlier. That night, it failed. Chaos ensued, lions were on the loose, an NYPD sergeant heroically rescued the babies that they had in, in one of those incubator exhibits. Dreamland was completely destroyed and never rebuilt. After quite the exciting career, the New Yorker was taken out of service in 1931, auctioned off, and replaced with a new fireboat. Firehouse itself was reaching the end of its days, and Battery Park was about to be closed for several years while the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel was built. Engine 57 was moved to then Pier 1 in 1941. It's my last one. <laughs> so she, I have just enough time for a few questions. Um, and of course it's my favorite because it has to do with, you know, a very infamous place. Um, the Bellevue Psychopathic Hospital, as it was called at the time, was built by Charles B. Myers in 1931 in the Italian Renaissance style. This building is still standing along the East River on First Avenue between 29th and 30th Streets, occupying an entire city block. When it was built, it joined a growing complex for Bellevue and was intended to match the existing buildings, which were designed by architects McKim, Mead, and White. Same color brick embellished with granite base coarse limestone and terracotta trimmings. By then, McKim, Mead, and White were barely active. Myers had just designed the Jiminy Hall building, the one that is off of Union Square and was a favorite of then Mayor Jimmy Walker. In these photos, you can see, these are photos from our collection from the Department of Charities. And you can see how on the left-hand side, there's just an empty space. It's all ready for something to be built there. And on the right-hand side, the psychopathic hospital is located there on the far right. Prior to its construction, Bellevue's mental health facilities were part of the main hospital and included a pavilion for the insane in 1879 and its first alcoholic ward in 1892. Dr. Minas Gregory, a well-known psychiatrist who spent his career working in Bellevue's psychiatric division, is credited with being one of is credited as being the one who conceived of the psychiatric building for the hospital after a trip to Europe to examine similar institutions, a temple of health he called it. Wanting to create a very clean and stately environment for the new hospital was right on brand for Dr. Gregory. In his position, he had already changed the terminology, preferring psychopathic to the word insane, thinking this would somehow make the patient seem more curable. He had also taken the iron bars off of the old pavilion's windows and had lessened the use of narcotics and physical restraints on the patients. Dr. Gregory was seen as a good guy in the field at a time when most medical professionals were bad guys in, in this field. Before the hospital was built, the New York Times said it would be one of the finest hospitals in the world for the treatment of mental disorders and thoroughly modern at a cost of $3 million. Unsurprisingly, by the time it was finished, the cost would be more like $4.3 million, which is $66 million in today's money. It was designed as a single building with three separate units. One was a 10 story high to house administrative services, doctor's offices, labs, and a library. The second was eight stories for mild cases, and the other also eight stories for more advanced cases. And there are facilities for recreation, occupational therapy, physio, electro, and hydrotherapy, an outpatient clinic, all sorts of stuff. Rooms were designed to either house one, two, or three patients at a time. Here's, so here's a typical, this is the first floor, so you can kind of, in the center where the, the auditorium was, um, different entrances and courtyards. 
And then this is the second floor that illustrates a typical floor with patients' bedrooms and different words for them would be, most of them have the same kind of look. Um, in a mental health bulletin, it was written that special consideration had been given to the plans to incorporate, incorporate within the building the appearance and aspect of home or normal living conditions with simple decorations and color tones believed to have the most soothing effect upon the patient. 100 of the 600 beds were dedicated for the study and, study and treatment of children under the supervision of the Department of Education. Completing the building was nothing short of dramatic and filled with accusations of corruption and mismanagement. Its lavish exterior juxtaposed against the Great Depression couldn't have been more tone deaf. When ground was broken on June 18, 1930, it was thought that the building would be completed at the end of 1931. And almost a year later, the cornerstone was just being laid. Blaze were plentiful. It reportedly took a year to choose the architect and another to draw the plans. And then, according to the acting commissioner of hospitals, after the con contractor had collected all the funds he could get, he just left for Europe and never came back. <laughs> the hospital partially opened in May 1933 with the 600 bed facility only ready for 375. A formal dedication occurred later that year in November where tribute was paid to Dr. Gregory for his vision. Dr. Gregory would resign from his post in 1934 in an investigation of his division by the Commissioner of Hospitals, Dr. S.S. Coldwater, whose name you probably recognize from being on another hospital here. Um, this forms a spectacular tit-for-tat relationship between Dr. Gregory and Dr. Goldwater, which the New York Times covered extensively and was very difficult for me to stop reading and continue with this. Um, Dr. Gregory would die in 1941. Over the years, the building and its institution went from temple of health to scary place you didn't want to go and was the subject of many films, novels, and exposés. The hospital saw many celebrity patients. Norman Mailer was sent there after stabbing his wife in a drunken rage. William Burroughs after he chopped off his own finger to impress somebody. Eugene O'Neill had several stays in the alcoholic ward. Sylvia Plath came after a nervous breakdown and infamous criminals like the Mad Bomber and John Lennon's assassin, Mark David Chapman, were briefly committed here. In 1984, the city began transitioning the building into a homeless shelter and intake center, but much of it was left empty and is still empty. Around 2008, a proposal to turn the building into a hotel surfaced. Because of this H layout, it seemed like it would be great because there's already all these rooms and everything. Kind of freaked some people out, I think. Um, still hasn't happened. So we'll see. And here's the text photo. This is interesting because they were taking these when the building had just been finished. So it still looks like it's a little bit under construction. And that's it. And I think ready for your questions. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm, you know, this is our first um, launch series. We will. Um, have this event every month. I'm gonna share on the chat our upcoming event and the link, but now we are going to jump into the questions. Thank you for your support. Okay, hi, this is Latani Jones. I'm with the uh, Department of Records. I'll just jump in uh, so we can get to as many questions as possible. Um, just to begin, we had a comment from Christine Nelson that she was um, grateful for just getting a glimpse of the massive scope of the project and it allowed her to have a better understanding of some of the uh, time and care and resources needed to get to the point where these documents are able to be accessed. Um, and we had a couple questions around access from Kate and Sarah. Um, the first is what determines which plans get archived, scanned, digitized, and then available to the public for review. And similarly, is that the goal for this project to make the plans available similar to our tax photo collection? So the plans are, all the plans are technically available for the public to view. Um, you just have to send a request and I, we will pull whatever you're looking for and process that to the point where uh, someone can come and look at the plan. So pre pandemic, the normal, way of doing business was we would pull the plans, 
get them in shape enough for someone to be able to handle them. And then you could come and look at them. And then if there was something you wanted scanned, um, those would get set aside. And then we charge for scanning uh, for high resolution scans. And in that way, all the plans are available for researchers. So what we're doing um, now is just going through all the plans to try to get them in the position where when someone asks, it will take a very short period of time as opposed to the kind of days, hours that it takes now for things that haven't been processed yet. So we're trying to go through in a much more, um, you know, block by block way. So by the end of it, however many years from now, the end of it is everything will be ready to go when someone asks. But right now you can still ask. It just might take a while. Um, we are not digitizing everything because there really are, there's going to be, there's just, you know, over 100,000 plans. So it's not a great use of server space. But we digitize when we digitize on demand, those of course get saved. And if someone asks for those again, they're available. And then we are digitizing um, when we find buildings of particular historic importance or things that are particularly beautiful. So I don't, I don't know, maybe in the future, but it doesn't seem necessary since so many of the drawings are things like installing a sink in a second floor apartment or, you know, a lot of the drawings are just things that unless you have a really good research reason, you probably aren't looking for that. So, you know, some people, if you want to see the building you live in, you can ask, and if we have them, we'll get them for you. Okay. Is there anything more you want to add to that, Alex, or should I move on to um, No, I just saw that someone asked about how do you know if there are plans? We um, have to just go and look, basically, is the short answer. Um, we have the it's before below 34th street so that narrows it down some but yeah like what exactly we have a lot of times we don't know until we unroll run roll what where it should be basically okay but at the end of this project we will know yeah. yes that's the goal <laughs> yeah. of the entire project <laughs> Just to tell you but it's going to be a while okay um andrew asked the rest of manhattan was microfiched poorly, will you be trying to get these drawings? Um, all records from Brooklyn have been removed from the Department of Buildings. Might these come to the archives as well? So we don't have Brooklyn and I don't really know where the Brooklyn drawings are. So each um, borough, the drawings are filed with that borough's Department of Buildings. Uh, so what we have it's, it's a very confusing thing because I can't really even tell you where the plans for the blocks above 34th Street actually are. We have what we have because they were part of this microfilming project that didn't go well. And so because the DOB didn't want them anymore, they were going to dispose of them, they came here. I actually don't know really where the rest of these things are. Someone, possibly somewhere in New Jersey, I heard a rumor, but I don't yeah, know. that's what I was going to say, too. <laughs> I think it's in New Jersey somewhere. Somewhere in New Jersey. Um, where can, and if, again, if you could answer these questions, let us know. If not, uh, where can Sanborn maps um, or city maps be located, and what is the pr procedure to retrieve them? So almost every library will have th these kind of insurance maps. Um, the ones that I use for our presentation, I actually got from the New York Public Library because they have a bunch scanned and you can just either Google like NYPL Sanborn maps or something along those lines or go straight to their catalog. But there are a lot of institutions who have done the same thing and they'll be the, the same map everywhere. So they're, they're pretty plentiful out there. Sorry, I didn't realize it was uh, not muted. Uh, um, how are we scanning the uh, plans? Overhead camera, large size scanner? So um, most of the plans uh, we're using a large format scanner um, because these are kind of working documents. If something's particularly 
uh, nice or for a particularly important building, um, it'll go through our conservation department. And so it might be digitized um, with a uh, photographed with a digital camera, but generally we're using a large format scanner. And do the plans include church buildings? Some. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Abu. Um, how do you preserve blueprints? And is there anything um, that you should keep in mind when doing so? Just keep them out of the light um, is the most important thing. So, uh, yeah. So these will be, you know, in boxes in a storage room with um, controlled temperature and, you know, in the dark most of the time. But for blueprints in particular, uh, you want to keep them covered when you're not looking at them. And then, like I showed in my slides, because these aren't all blueprints, it's different, different processes, some with chemicals that are still degrading. We try to keep the different kinds of plants separated from each other with sheets of mylar so the chemicals can't sort of move from one type of plant to another. Okay, and then we have time for perhaps one more question. Um, we have a question from Kevin on how is Doris, Doris's collection compared to the A3 library at Columbia and if we work together in some capacity? So I'd say, um, I don't know a ton about the Avery, but I will say that I think a lot of what they have are um, probably nicer drawings in that they are perhaps the collections of architecture firms or um, maybe more display drawings uh, for different architects. I don't know that completely. Um, we do, I do look um, for information from the Avery when someone requests something and we don't have it here. Our drawings, because of the way they were compiled and the nature of what they are, they were working drawings for everything. Um, they're probably a lot rougher, I <laughs> think, a lot, a lot more diverse, a lot bigger of a collection and in rougher shape. Yeah, that's what I would say too. <laughs> And um, I think we have time for one more question with the one minute remaining. Are there plans to make a public facing metadata access point like a finding aid? There is a finding aid. I believe Raul is going to link to the page where you could find those. Um, and in the next few months, we should have our new interface set up where you can look up um, all of our EAD finding aids and it'll be a lot easier to access our collections. But that's still TBD on the date. It's just a little teaser though for you now. Okay, great. So thank you to Amy and Alex for joining, for sharing their uh, knowledge about this process with us today. Raul, please add the link to the finding aid in the chat. And thank you for joining us for our first Lunch and Learn. We will be having one next month. Go ahead, Raul. Thank you so much for your support and I'm sharing the link for the upcoming event, um, the launch series, and I will share the link about the collection of the buildings. Back to Latonia. Yeah, that's it, because we're at 201 on the dot, and we want to respect everyone's time. Lunch and Learn has been done, our first one in the bag. Thank <laughs> you for joining us. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.